Um, so John, it's good to see be with you. Last time I saw you was in Seattle a couple months ago, celebrating your opening with the uh, Seattle Art Museum. So we were talking about the impact of COVID on some of your process. Uh, you've been at home. Um, you had encountered pneumonia a year ago, and that's left you feeling a very deep sense of um, caution about this. How does how does that affect your your work right now? It's um, it's been a really you know, to you know quote a Chinese phrase. It's been a very interesting time. Uh, it, on lots of levels, actually, but I, I think in relation to work, I'm probably like a lot of people um, uh, at the moment. You, you know, you one has a practice, and the practice throws up a set of questions, which you're in some ways trying to uh, use as reflections or connectors to a broader out there, a society. One for right. Um, and what happened with the pandemic is that you suddenly got this really forceful sense, you know, that whatever strains of your work is about important things, this was the moment for it, you know? Like, I've never felt more weirdly out of body and at home at the same time, you know? Wow. Um, it's been a very odd time. I've, never, I've also never felt as threatened, you know, and I've been, you know, listen, I always got, I always got shot in Greenwood, Mississippi by, by some folk as I was filming, same in Liberia, you know, um, and yet this period has felt more threatening for me than anything else, you know. I think it's partly obviously because I've got this problem i had this problem with pneumonia before so you know <laughs> i've had to be careful but it's it's a it's a more deeper existential thing you you just suddenly felt um as if your hold on on this thing life you know society was very 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 tenuous um especially as people started to sort of die around you you know um yep. you know <laughs> and by the time <laughs> By the time the pandemic kind of intersected, crossed uh, with the BLM moment, I really, really then started to feel <laughs> very fragile, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, the work has felt, you know, it's, it's almost like many of the pieces that I've been grappling with uh, over the years seem to find a kind of natural home in the moment. You know, um, it's not so much the subject matter, but the approach to many of the work seemed to just feel as if this was their, their moment. So I, 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 a long-winded way of saying it's been both good times and very, very bad times, I suppose. Mm. Okay. And so let's unpack that, because I think a lot of your work has been about the intersection of going to these remote places and documenting, but then adding a sort of a narrative character to the whole process whether it be sort of a historical engagement with exploring. Um, so that, that historical component, amusingly enough, art in the time of pandemic, it was one, a lot of people have argued that that was one of the pivot points for the Renaissance, because uh, mm -hmm. the Black Plague had come into Europe and depleted it like large scales about the population. Mm -hmm. um, the actual work process changed, and a lot of people are beginning to kind of realize that the influenza 1918 epidemic also, mm -hmm. of course, radically changed the course of the early 20th century. So, I mean, do you feel there's any like legacy of this over your work for the next couple of years, or are you going to kind of just contextualize this, like you know, put it in parentheses, 2020, and then <laughs> move on? No, I mean, this, um, you know, I was talking to Renee Green, a uh, friend of mine, this morning, and she used a phrase that I thought was so suggestive and resonant of the moment. You know, um, she was talking about what she was doing, and she said, you know, um, She's grappling with, you know, ongoing becomings. <laughs> I thought, mm -hmm. what a great phrase for describing, in a way, the moment for me. I, I mean, I, I think this has completely transformed my practice uh, in ways that I can't even... Uh, I mean, if we had three hours, I might be able to explain it all. You know, I can't do it in the time that we've got. It's been seismic, uh, 
you know. Wow. Um, okay. for, on on lots of levels, epistemic, you know, practical, logistical, you know. So, for instance, um, when we met in Seattle, I had gone off and and returned to Vancouver Island to 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 scout, you know, right. locations mm-hmm. for a project that I was planning to do. Now, um, that's, I come from Mark one, you know, uh, work underscored by a certain ethnographic strain, um, location based, research based, but usually the relationship between location and research uh, being that the research is going to lead to some sort of location. All of that's going to change. Because for the foreseeable future, I can't return to Vancouver Island, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> for the foreseeable future. Um, and that's been both a real blessing and a curse. I mean, it's, it's introduced all manner of processes of working into the mix that I wouldn't have been comfortable with before. Like, I wouldn't have been comfortable <clears throat> saying to someone in Bahia, could you shoot something for me and if they right. ask what for me to say well look it just um yeah here's a photograph that i'll send you try and base this on on um, what you need to do or saying to three cinematographers you know uh, recently for washington can you go to washington and film that that black day of protest for me um you know be- pre-pandemic i would have wanted to be there myself and I would have seen it as a kind of act of failure on my part if I wasn't present when the images were somehow being gathered. I'm now really comfortable, <laughs> very, right. very comfortable with this decentered collaborative project. You know. Okay, of, let's uh, let's unpack that because I think the Seattle okay. Museum has some of some some amazing work of yours, whether it be the Tropicos, uh, which is sort of the encounter between the British and the African uh, kind of sub-Saharan African kind of issues that I think was a beautiful visual essay about that. Uh, Vertigo Sea, which is also one of your works meditating on those sort of larger oceanic. Um, there's a kind of a sub-theme of migration that you, Yinka Shonabare, and Isaac Julian as, as um, Black British um, artists, you guys are dealing with a little bit of that archival with interventions of how you think about the contemporary intervening in the past. Um, it's, a, it's really beautiful. Um, the show is even called Future History. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, one of your classic works um, is, uh, of course, Last Angel of History. Now, I mean, the way you were just talking about your work, one of the things that struck me, and let me know if I'm mischaracterizing this, but I'm fascinated with how um, the legacy of history informs your practice. Um, mm-hmm. And you've always been an archival oriented artist. You, you collect all sorts of materials. There's some other, you know, more current people, for example, like, ah, um, oh, geez, there's so many artists right now. Um, <clears throat> I'm not even sure where to begin, but there's <laughs> somehow that legacy of the archive over your work. Um, mm-hmm. Could we unpack that a little bit? Because those three pieces at the sure. Seattle Museum are informed, but I think at least that's, that's part of the practice. Sure. I mean, you know, um, th- this is also a really good time to, to unpack the, obsessi- the obsessive uh, investments in the archival that has been part of my, my practice, if you will. Um, I mean, I, if, I can't think of a more archival moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, a moment which is um, haunted by the traces and deposits of uh, other presences, you know, from the elsewhere, if you will. You know, it feels almost as if the whole of um, uh, life at the moment is one big archival experiment. You know, here you have this uh, virus, <laughs> which clearly is from an elsewhere mm-hmm. right? and it's it's moved into our lives and created maximum chaos and in the process of creating this maximum chaos new narratives and new histories and new ways of being are beginning to emerge you know in many ways that sort of is pretty much what i feel about the archival deposit that's that's how i think it works that's how i want it to work 
you know, um, I want to to be able to find things which appear to be um, separate from this. And almost, uh, this isn't going to be a pleasant way of putting it, but I think it's the right way to put it, almost contaminating the present mm -hmm. with its presence, you know, um, uh, forcing a kind of collision between worlds, between epochs and decades and narratives. Um, because I think that's how all new narratives begin, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty much how all new things come into being. So um, I'm, I'm living now in a period that's characterized by what people are calling a pandemic, and that's created all manner of narratives, which are completely new about how you, how you walk on the street, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what you do. Um, I've never washed my hands as much as I have done in the last <laughs> four months. I didn't even realize you could wash your hands so often. Um, you know what I mean? So the, the, the sense of um, the archival that informs the work is, is not an innocent one. I know what it means to bring something from elsewhere into a present. I know what the implications are for saying, I want to take something from one geographic location in a certain period of time and relocate it into a present. And that doesn't, it's not necessarily, um, it's almost an impulse rather than a, an artifact. You know, so I'm not talking necessarily a fragment of the past. Sometimes it's just an idea of the past that needs to be brought into the present, you know? So when you mention Tropicus and you say, Tropicus is entirely fictive, a piece, mm -hmm. yeah? And yet it is completely informed by sort of archival take, if you will, on that Elizabethan moment, because those moments happened, right? But right. there's no record of it anyway. <laughs> there's no record really of enslaved Africans being taken into English manor houses or country houses um, in the 15th century. One or two, but not, it's not a known um, narrative, if, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. But the beauty of your work is that that kind of right at the edge of what was portrayed in, like, say, for example, Yinka Shonabari will stage an elaborate one scene situation mm -hmm. uh, where the period costumes, the clothing, what you're doing, again, let me know if I'm mischaracterizing this. No, say, no, for no. example, some, yeah, someone like Arthur Jaffa has been doing um, you know, found footage, things like that. But then more artists, uh, pretty much like you, Yinka Shonabare, and of course, Shireen Nishat, would do much more elaborate um, stage situations. And then, I mean, you're right at the edge of the cinematic imagination um, because on one hand, you deal with montage. I mean, I think that that's a core John Comfort kind of approach is montage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and people like Ziga Vertov would call that dialectical montage, where you tell a story, Sergei Eisenstein more so. Mm -hmm. But pulling those, those narrative frag fragments together um, it allows you to create a different portal into the histories that you're dealing with, which I think you've done in a very powerful way. Um, mm -hmm. And the virus stuff that you were talking about earlier, what's even wilder is that one could argue the Black Plague set the stage for the Renaissance because of the realignment of power in the society. Like the workers, were, because there were far fewer workers, they were able to demand more. Uh, you know, benefits, more pay. Uh, they renegotiated their contract, so to speak, with the, the ruling class, whereas without the pandemic is increasing inequality. Yeah. Um, and I'd say that you're going to be seeing a lot more artists like reaching into what is similar kind of strengths that you have is that the power of the archive to inform the present, because right now we're all in this suspended moment. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really hard to figure the near future, but a lot of your work has that future history. Mm. But by the way, I've always wanted to ask you, did you take Go. that from Isaac, Isaac Asimov? Because he had the whole future history series, uh, the science fiction writer? No. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, we, may, we, may, we, 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 may, we may well have done, but it's, I okay. personally didn't, if that makes sense. Um, okay. I mean, you know, um, you just mentioned... Um, a figure who has been really important in my life. I think um, Eisenstein is a figure that I, I return to, the writings of Eisenstein. Mm -hmm. um, 
are very, very important to me because in Eisenstein's work, one finds the philosophy of bricolage, you know, at its finest. Um, well, when you then mix that, let's say, with the writings of another constant, uh, Virginia Woolf, I've just spent the lockdown rereading uh, and becoming friends again with, with Virginia Woolf. You know, um, what you find exactly the same sort of emphasis on, on bricolage in their work. I know people don't see it in those terms, but you know, in the waves, for instance, you've got this incredible juxtaposition of two very um, real and diametrically opposed entities. Um, the world of quote unquote nature, you know, wind, light, sea, sun, the forces of those, and the internal world of human beings. And these two sit side by side overlapping occasionally, but definitely as two separate entities. Um, and the whole force of the waves comes from this montage of these two worlds. It's extraordinary, you know. So she doesn't on the surface have anything at all in common <laughs> with Eisenstein. And yet one finds the same, same approach. And it's been important to me, as I said, I think in our last conversation, because for me, montage isn't just a formal question. Um, it's almost a Commonwealth experiment for me because if you can make the formal questions of montage work in a project, it by implication means they could work in life. Mm -hmm. So it has this ethical dimension, you know, uh, which is very important for me. Well, what's the beauty of, I think your work, if you think about Sergei Eisenstein as one of those people that was like a foundation for cinema for the 20th century, mm -hmm. it's, it was a counter narrative to D.W. Griffith because the, the idea of Soviet cinema was about revolution, emancipation, mm -hmm. giving people better tools with propaganda. Mm -hmm. But when you're with the English, what I view, a lot of your work is kind of engaging. Again, I've always, I'm always a little careful about, because it's, it's a collage based dynamic because of the, the fact on one hand, you're dealing with diaspora as Ghanaian, mm. uh, black British, and then yeah. above all, someone who's deeply interested in the history of cinema. Those are all different, like um, kind of, for lack of a better word, spaces in the culture. Diaspora obviously mm. informs a lot of your work. Mm. So um, do you feel like right now cinema is changing under the, the pivot because of COVID? People are more experiencing, like a lot of the movie theaters here in the US are closing. You view your work as much more in a formal museum um, environment, but it's still informed by that cinematic experience. Like yeah. people should, no. are, like David Lynch famously said, who would want to watch a movie on their phone? Do you remember that? <laughs> he was complaining. Um, well, a lot more people are going to probably be watching movies and everything on their mobile devices. Does that affect your think thought process? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> one of the things that the lockdown uh, did was, was to force a whole number of us, and I know this because I've had those conversations with with um, uh, with the cinema, um, to the point where I think one can see the outlines very clearly of something called the post cinematic emerging, you know, um, mm -hmm. and this post cinematic imaginary machine has several tentacles. Some of them are not necessarily, you know, vanguardist or avant-garde gestures at all. You know, what Netflix and the streaming platforms, for instance, are doing uh, is an attempt, if you will, to, to overcome cinema, you know, to say to people, or, or really to, to, to force a cut in, in the causation of cinema equals audience, right? Um, no according to Netflix, cinema should equal viewer, <laughs> subscriber, <laughs> right. not audience, you know. Um, so they are very invested in the, in the breakup of the collective, um, very involved in the atomizing, um, in a way that I think uh, the implications of which are completely post-cinematic, you know. Um, but I, there's also the sense, uh, more and more, that, that a, a brand of, cinema that, that gave birth to many of us, that 
independent cinema or radical cinema, call it what you will, um, that these are now entering a kind of twilight. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that they don't exist and can't exist in the same platforms that they used to, you know, the film festivals, um, you know, uh, what's the, the, the small art house uh, rep cinemas, and, you know, th those, are, those are spaces of precarity at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and COVID has really underscored that precarity and fragility of that sector. So it, it's been a sort of weird time to, to get you to think about what future histories might be. But at the moment, it feels as if the image is up in the air, out for grabs. Quite a few players are pitching for the image, pitching for it to have a new home. And, and, and the cinema, as we've understood it, is one. Um, which is an extraordinary thing to say. In 1955, the cinema was the only place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, television occasionally said, well, I'd like, a, I'd, I'd like a go at this if you don't mind, Mr. Cinema or Mrs. Cinema. And a uh, and, uh, couple of cinemas said, fine, by all means, have a go. Now, just about everywhere you look, someone wants to, to have a piece of the, of the, the image um, family. So, yeah, interesting times. Really strange, okay. but interesting times. Mm -hmm. Well, your work, I mean, to me, the beauty of it has always been that you've occupied the space between the fine arts and the cinematic. And again, much more like even um, Steve McQueen, who's part of your generation as well, um, mm -hmm. he's branched out almost to full scale film at this point. More people know Steve in the, yes. you know, the normal film, almost mainstream. I guess he is mainstream now. I mean, think of it. <laughs> but um, oh, you win an Oscar, you know, you're mainstream. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so he, you're, you guys have come up in a similar generation. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on Black British cinema overall, because in America, obviously, we've had such a robust, I mean, I always chuckle the fact that um, Spike Lee and Jim Jarmers both studied at NYU at the same time. I mean, it's mm -hmm. always hard to make that up, or the European tradition versus the, the Black British tradition. You guys are right in the middle of the, all these different sort of art house kind of approaches. Does, mm -hmm. any, any thoughts on that, just out of curiosity? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in a weird sort of way, um, it's never been better for, for Black British cinema. Steve McQueen's uh, made four feature-length films, um, two of them released uh, immediately after Cannes. Um, you know, uh, the younger directors coming along, you know, it's just never been a better time, really. Um, but my sense is that even that growth, you know, in a world now where you can have four or five black British directors, Amara Santi, you know, uh, Steve McQueen, um, what's his name, Chiwetel Legio for the actors, made a big feature, and lots of younger ones who are making, making future debuts and so on. But even though that's happening, it's happening, it seems to me, in a space of maximum precarity for the medium itself. You know, um, because I'm not sure. I'm absolutely and really, really not sure um, what the future holds for uh, a practice based on making moving image works which are shown to an audience, quote unquote, in shared spaces. I, I'm just not sure what the future right, holds. I mean you know. Okay, so she's actually going to see, like, the only movie I've seen all year in a physical cinema space was, well, actually there's two, but we, there were only four people in an entire big movie theater. I went to, there was a yeah. special screening of Christopher Nolan's Tenet, which, oh. um, I had to go see that in a large scale film because I was just really, um, I was, I, the premise of it is, again, and the, the lead, uh, you know, this is African American doing this whole science fiction narrative. I was like, this is brilliant. And I, they also did a reissue of Akira, the sort of the 1989 oh, Japanese wow. that that's now been released at 4K and it, it played in entirely four cinemas, if I remember correctly, throughout the US. One was in Colorado and I drove down to see it because I was like, and again, there were four people in the entire movie theater and everyone was <laughs> really, I, the movie theaters here are suffering big time. So I think you're going to, you're right, you're going to be seeing a tremendous amount of pivot. Like, mm -hmm. I just saw Borat on the flight back, Borat 2, which, amusing enough, 
there is not any relationship between your work and Sasha Baron Cohen at all, at least it, except for one <laughs> <so> <laughs> weird thing. <laughs> he, you know, the idea that that kind of like he records sort of narrative where there's hidden dimensions of how each character interviews people and they don't know who he is. Right. I've always chuckled about that. Like, how could they not know? Like how? But um, long story short, I think you, like like you were saying, we're going to be seeing a huge pivot. So speaking of pivot, let's mm -hmm. talk about techniques um, because th there's been an evolution of your style over the last several years, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, on one hand, you were a formal studio kind of purist. Like there were a lot of talking heads interviews, yeah. and then you pivoted more to full scale set design and mm -hmm. costumes. Do you, can you riff on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, one of the the great wave of change that happened in the uh, independent movement, the art movement in this country, um, happened in the late 70s around the discussion of Bertolt Brecht, interestingly. Um, and that argument was about whether or not the avant-garde needs to find a home, you know, especially the moving image avant-garde needs to find a home inside mainstream institutions, you know, television, right. cinema, so on. Before that, people were quite happy to be making films a bit like one had in the same, similar thing in New York where you were showing laughs and, you know, film archives and millenniums and, you know, those sorts of spaces where, where our space, you know, um, and I think what happened was, um, as we got going, by we, I mean Black Audio Film Collective, as we got going as a, as a sort of cinecultural form, um, the, the place we found ourselves gravitating towards more and more was television. Um, because of that Brechtian argument about the need to, to, to um, migrate the epic from the margins to, to the center, you know. Um, and of course, <clears throat> television's key obsession is with the nonfiction, the documentary, if you will. Um, we came into it and I came into it really as part of a group of um, uh, filmmakers who were really interested in, in unearthing, um, uh, discovering hidden histories of black life. Um, and so we went and we devolved a certain kind of cinema of humility, if you will, which simply said, okay, Mr. Jarvis, you came from the Caribbean in the 1950s, early 1950s. Can you tell us something about your experience of that? Um, and I did a lot of oral history type projects like that because we, I was just interested and fascinated by, by ordinary black folk, <laughs> mm -hmm. what, they had to, what they had to say. And um, so the, the, the talking head form was the most appropriate for, for that. Now, in the course of doing that, we sort of learned um, a few things about the, the migrant experience. And, and I tried to codify that into a film that I did called The Nine Muses. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd probably notice that after The Nine Muses, I haven't gone back to, <laughs> to, to the talking head form again. Um, Essentially, what we learned was, was this, you know, um, uh, I think there's a kind of narrative of, of migration which comes with sort of three distinct fragments. Um, for instance, as I interviewed people, we started to realize that when they described coming, they would always... Uh, discuss it as a, a journey from somewhere warm to somewhere cold. Now, this is, you know, might be, might sound normal, but actually it isn't at all because a lot of these guys um, and women came in the summer. So you start to realize that actually what they're talking about isn't a physical thing. The coldness in question isn't physical at all. And they also talked a lot about a feeling of loneliness on the journey. 
which is again strange because most of them came as part of groups, you know, on boats or planes later on, you know, so they were, they were traveling en masse. And yet the sense of existential isolation was something that was, was uh, very clear in everything that they said to you. And the final thing that they said was when they arrived, they felt slightly out of place because of how they were dressed. Because they'd come from these, you know, kind of uh, colonies where there was no ration. They were coming to post-war Britain with this austerity and rationing and no color and only black and blue and brown. And, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> so they, they were coming. And um, we realized that actually all three uh, grand narratives were about a certain form of becoming. That's really what they were describing to us, the poetics of becoming in Britain as an outsider. Well, uh -huh. And um, once, I, once I got that, I've been pretty much running with that ever since. Because once you understand the implication of lives, you don't need to then continuously try to, to discover the secret of it. You know, uh, once I realized that that's what the main lesson in all these interviews where we, we then started to experiment with how you relocate the implications of that um, insight into other forms. Really. So that's why I do less and less <laughs> talking head stuff. Okay. I mean, the fun part about your work and the, the legacy or the, what I'm calling the logic of diaspora seems to really be a continuity between the works. And so that logic of diaspora implies generations because the, the first generation obviously uh, is adjusting like you were just saying to that context of being um, out of place and the sort of existential relationship to the country that they left and then the country they've arrived at which pa people like Paul Gilroy have explored really beautifully um, and of course um, there's also people like Edward Said who you know is at Columbia University as a, as a yeah. sort of diaspora from the sort of Middle East but the the kind of cross-section of Ghana it's really fascinating because people like you David Aje who's also Ghanaian uh, Echo Eshin there's a there's a kind of a reverse going on right now where I'm seeing a, Ghana is booming. So a lot of people are actually beginning to do quite a bit more um, in the home country. Do you have any yeah. thoughts about that or just the like the circular yeah. leg legacy of, of diaspora? Yeah, because there's no, I yeah. mean, but, you know, it's interesting that you, you mentioned um, the, the three figures you mentioned myself, you know, uh, David and, and Echo are all quintessential diasporic products quintessential you know David uh, lived I think um, most of his childhood in Dar es Salaam before coming to England uh, his father was a Zulu-Roman diplomat um, uh, Echo's uh, parents were also involved with the same political project that my parents were uh, and so left pretty much the same time um, to come to England but the other really important um, feature for me anyway, is that um, I was aware there was something called a diaspora because of where and how I grew up, you know. I mean, uh, I think I told you that I lived on a road in, in Accra um, as a boy and at the end of that road was um, the grand old man of African-American letters, W.B. Du Bois. Du Bois was in Ghana at the time and died in Ghana in 63. So there was a short moment when I could walk past the house and see, you know, this man who was the, one of the most formative influences on, on um, what one could call the African diaspora. Um, sitting there, reading a book, you know, my, my mother was, uh, in Ghana in, in 65 when um, uh, at the university she was at, Malcolm X turned up and, and spoke and said, oh, when I go back, you know, I think I'm going to be dead. And of course, as soon as he went back, he was in February 65, you know. So, I mean, the, the sense that there's a world out there um, which was uh, tri-continental, if you will, um, in which blackness was a feature, was something I was aware of 
uh, from a very early age. And, and that is what informs my practice. So we met because I was um, keen to do something on Afrofuturism, which is a term that was just beginning to surface. And, um, and I was happy to come to New York to meet you and Greg Tate, and, uh, but then go to Detroit and meet you know, Derek May and Carl Craig, and then London to speak to Goldie and, you know, because I, it became clear to me that in order to understand the full reach of this term, you needed a kind of tri-continental understanding of it, you know. That's always been part of, part of the, the work that I do, and um, I'm not sure that it's ever going to change, frankly, you know. Um, I'm not sure it's going to change. There's a piece that I've just done, um, which would be in the new show at the Listen. Uh, I know we're not talking necessarily about my work, <laughs> but I'll tell you yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, it's, it, it's very short, it's 10 minutes long. It's um, using a very, very famous track uh, by Max Roach from you know that wonderful album that he did called we insist you know um, and on the track he has an eight minute piece called triptych and triptych is made of three parts you know prayer protest and uh, peace i've used it before but you know there was something about working on this piece of portraits from bahia and i just thought okay let me put these two together for a moment and there it was the African diaspora in its, in its complete variety, richness, diversity, strangeness, weirdness, every, everything was there, you know? Um, in that conversation between that track and this range of people, it's just extraordinary. Um, and I think it's that, that's the promise that, that fuels the practice, that, that if I come to New York and I sit down with you, I would hear something which can only be heard because I'm in New York talking to you and nowhere else, you know? Um, so so the, the spaces and the forms that blackness takes in all these spaces is completely unique. And yet there is a sort of overlap, <laughs> you know? You're not Detroit folk, Detroit folk are not London folk, London folk are almost certainly not Jamaica folk, but somehow in having, um, and this is where you know montage comes in in having a palette right um a canvas in which you can stitch this range something absolutely beautiful emerges which would not have done been the case rather if i had just spoken to new york folk or detroit folk or, or london mm -hmm. folk. you know what i mean that's that's the ethical montage that i was um talking about in the beginning you know well i mean john and there's that i love hearing you break that down because i mean on one hand, if many people, well, I'm going to guess, just to put this out there, is that people have seen the very clean, polished work um, at stuff like SF MoMA, uh, of course, Seattle Art Museum, and mm -hmm. the difference between the early work, which was very documentary-based, which I've used coming out of the Black Audio Film Collective and the legacy of your sort of political documentary work. Mm -hmm. What's the trajectory for the listen one? Because I loved hearing, you just broached in that a little bit, and but that's your next project. And yes. I, I do want people to realize... Um, we're talking about uh, John, what John did at the Seattle Art Museum, but uh, the next one is coming up at the Listen Gallery. Um, so um, I will probably have to check that out virtually. Um, yeah, no, but sure. can you walk us, <laughs> just walk us through the project and uh, maybe that'll um, just give us a sense of what's yeah, going on. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, um, the moment, as you know, um, well, specifically the, the British variant of this moment um, was, uh, the sense that our lives had been seized by two pandemics actually one was the 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 viral pandemic but the other was a sort of uh, what seemed to be an orgy of black killings which <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah. took on these uh, pandemic like proportions you know you it seemed <laughs> like almost every day you you open the newspaper, somebody else had been shot, whether in their homes or, <laughs> you know, trying to pass over a fake note. Or, I mean, it just seemed like the range of violence visited on black bodies somehow 
magnified or intensified or multiplied, I don't know, or all three at the same time, you know. Um, and some, in a weird way, the clash of pandemics seemed to galvanize and energize a whole range of young black folk in this country, you know. Um, the culmination of much of their activity was uh, focused on, the, on a, a monument, um, a statue that stood for a century plus in, in a place in England called Bristol, yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, which um, uh, was basically torn down. And uh, that created a whole host of conversations here about black lives, how they or don't matter, um, but all centering on this idea that, that uh, Britishness is embodied in certain institutions, certain monuments, and those need to be left alone. Right? Um, so uh, much of the work that I'm doing at the Listen is a return, if you like, to, to the monument. It's about reinterrogating it again, because that's where I started. The very first pieces of work that we did, um, Signs of Empire and Images of Nationality between 82 and 85, were almost entirely based on uh, the monument in, in Britain, you know, specifically the Victorian Albert, uh, the, the, the Albert monument. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I've seen, I mean, uh, Bristol, I mean, Bristol uh, occupies that kind of weird in between space because I, as far as I can recall, the Windrush and other kinds of um, the, the ships that would come in from the Caribbean um, had docked along some of these major cities um, yes. and the legacy of the Black Jamaican and, or, you know, Caribbean experience versus the, the West African experience. So those are totally different trajectories, but it's it really cool to hear you you obviously have brought so much of uh, that conversation into a kind of distillation like of cinema okay so we're, we're having a conversation on the eve of an election uh, that's mm -hmm. sort of overshadowed by this idea of a pandemic but we're not just in a pandemic we're in an information pandemic and most of the trump administration comes out of reality tv and documentaries mm -hmm. steve vannon mm -hmm. produced really bad documentaries trump did really bad reality tv do you have any thoughts on um, you know that and the upcoming election? Because um, don't forget, this is going to air right after. So let's see exactly. if you have a crystal ball. Uh, because <laughs> these guys, they definitely come out of a cinematic uh, sensibility, mm -hmm. and like they do. Yeah, it's I mean, like the, the, the really strange thing for for us is that uh, for once I'm going to take this guy seriously. I mean, I think like many people on on the left or the progressive side of life um we just didn't think he stood a chance the first time around mm -hmm. um so it was a complete shock <laughs> when you yeah. woke up the next day you're like, yep, he won um uh, so i don't know i mean this time i'm going to take it really seriously i'm hoping that by the time this plays he's not there in which case the ambience around our conversation will be a glow, I think. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If he's one, then I think there'll be a lot of depressed people listening to this, in which case, what can we say? Well, you know, sorry. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't know, really, but it, it, it is fascinating, um, this time shift and time traveling uh, feature. Uh, because in some ways, we've both been fascinated with this all our lives, really, haven't we? you know yeah traveling in time shifts um so um i'm gonna make a prediction um to my future self now <laughs> <laughs> you know, i want my future self to live with it whatever it is you know um it is going to be if he's one pretty serious there'll be a lot of work to do you know on both sides of of the atlantic because there are people on this side of the water who are absolutely animated, energized, um, brought into being by what he's been doing, you know? Um, so for all our sakes, on both sides of the water, I hope that by the time this plays, he's not there, but who knows? <laughs> History's kind of like that, you know?
Well, the, the polls in the last election, I mean, I, my motto right now is we have this sort of shadow of how politics and the idea, sort of ideology, the sort of toxic ideologies of white grievance have mm. really fueled um, the, the right wing here. And mm. so the militias, um, like, I don't know if you, you, in England, I'm sure you probably have had this phenomenon. In the US, we call them Karens where it's very, um, you know, white women who feel very entitled, they'll go into a store and start screaming that they don't want to wear a mask and they have a public meltdown. Um, the, the whole mask thing is also mm -hmm. about the notion of respect for social space. It's really been mm -hmm. fascinating how we have to re-navigate social space. We've all become <laughs> a lot more familiar with our breath, you know, literally because, yes. Yes. you know, it's, you realize how much you took it for granted before. I mean, I really, <laughs> and I'm a regular runner, um, and running with a mask is a real drag, but I just want to respect social space. Mm. Um, and small things, but you're, you, the way that you're, you were just talking about it is like, we're now in the era of biopolitics, which I think yes. identity politics and class structures have overlapped because the, you were going to be seeing a lot more inequality, especially here in the U.S. with the Republicans just running with the Republican uh, Supreme Court mm. the, um, and every other possible angle. Mm -hmm. So um, it's your, these are where films like your work or give people, I think at least a better and more critical dimension of rethinking history so that we can rethink the present. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an issue that, yeah. It's been just fascinating, just because you mentioned social space. Um, I just wanted to add that actually one of the really interesting features of the present for me has been how younger activists have sought to reclaim space um, by forcing a conversation between the ethical and the legal or the ethical and the political if you will you know mm -hmm. so because for instance when those um, young activists took down the statue of the slave owner and trader you know uh, Edward Colston and threw him into the river in, in Bristol of course, the first thing that everyone in power said was, oh, you can't do that, that's, that's just not legal. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and you can see that the actions of these um, activists was throwing down a gauntlet to the society itself. Because in effect, what they were saying is, look, here is this guy who's uh, a trafficker, uh, borderline mass murderer you know why is a statue of him sitting in the middle of a multicultural society in which there are citizens yep. of people you know um of the enslaved who are there because of him why is he sitting there and it surely if you're going to bring up this question of the legal surely what should take precedence is the ethical you know why don't you see these kids, instead of seeing them as lawbreakers, why don't you see them as potential Rosa Parksons? Because the law is wrong. The law is wrong if it says the mass murderers, um, people who um, trafficked in their foreparents, um, have the right to sit amongst them and they don't have a say in whether or not that statue remains there. That's wrong. That's not right. Um, I mean, ethically, it's not right. I don't care whether it's legally right or not. Having, you know, folks of color sit in the back of the bus may have been legal in 1956, but it's also wrong, you know? So they forced this new debate between the ethical and the legal that I think is now reopening social space. You know, it's forcing us to, to rethink what we consider propriety in those spaces, who is allowed to inhabit that space. All of that, I think, has been really, really valuable and important. You know, so well, and um, yeah, I mean, John, this is where I really um, just think it's about giving people better tools to imagine what's possible. And I think that the issue when you talk about the people pulling those statues down, I mean, history is always a revisionist landscape. Yeah. And if you think about it as a as an unstable landscape, where who's in power? and their ideology then you know as george orwell says he who controls the past controls the pre the future he who controls the present controls the past mm -hmm. um and those those statues uh being ripped down to me that's kind of the way history always has worked um mm 
And the funny thing is, like, at the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989, all those um, statues of Lenin and Stalin got pulled down. Mm. There, a lot of people have collected them, and they're now, like, collector's items. You go to some weird person's house, and they have, like, a statue of Lenin or a brick from the, the Berlin Wall. Yes. But America... But America hasn't faced the legacy of that virtual bricks and mortar uh, approach to history because it was all suppressed. Um, and that, you know, when you were just talking about the Bristol is, issue, I mean, that was something that was really powerful that this summer, this summer in the U.S., there were so many police brutalities and crazy, you know, you know, collisions between history, you know, like pulling statues down. Uh, there was even riots in front of the White House where Trump walked out with a Bible held upside down. You know, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't make this up. But he did it to take a photo shoot. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, the, his perspective is of re reality TV and the sort of Fox News reality warp, draw, you know, it just mm -hmm. creates this fictional landscape. Mm -hmm. So with that said and done, um, I want to say one of the antidotes to that is, is, your, is your work. All right. So I guess given our time frame, it's, it's, um, I wanted to give you a heads up for the last maybe five minutes, just closing remarks. Right. Um, we were talking earlier about some of that pivot for because of the pandemic to more immersive cinema online experiences yeah. um and then your your current show coming up at the listen um what what's new for you in terms of thinking about philosophy of of cinema as we move further into this sort of decentered experience of mobile media um streaming and so on because you, you come out of a classic documentary political activist perspective that's one could argue similar to say for example michael moore's advocacy stuff at the beginning i get i mean more like the doc stuff um and then we moved further into the fine arts so that's a trajectory not a lot of people are able to bridge so i just wanted to hear your your sort of closing thoughts on that i mean in a weird sort of way uh, what what's happened is that i've started to walk my way back out of out of something because you know black audio set off really not to not to be um, documentaries at all, and as I said, but but we were we were pulled by the winds of history into this space because of that conversation around Brecht and um, how one makes and then Gramsci, you know, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist, how one makes hegemonic work and you know what the task of hegemonic practices should be and so on. So we I moved into into television more and more because of that. Um, to the point where by the 90s that was pretty much what we were doing. I started to I started to walk my way back from that about a decade and a bit ago now. Um, mm -hmm. And the walkout is almost now complete in the sense that um, I'm much more comfortable with um, multiple platforms that don't have these inbuilt hierarchies uh, that prescribe either practices or approaches or genres you know so for instance i mean the the world of documentary that i encountered as a sort of 20 year old um in the 80s had by the end of the 90s calcified and and atrophied really you know because we came into a space of documentary um which is more open-ended you know, you didn't need to have scripts and blah, blah, all of that. Um, by the time I stopped working actively in television, that had almost all gone. You know, it was um, a, a kind of uh, yeah, stereotype of itself uh, had started to emerge. Um, and I, I really didn't want, want to do it anymore. I mean, um, frankly, I'm not sure that much of what I'm interested in now fits most of that anyway, you know. Um, and it's not because of the subject matter, it's also part of the approach, you know. Um, as I said, I've been uh, trying to get to work with a lot of people, some of whom are not necessarily professionals or uh, film people or cinema people, to get them to to shoot stuff for me, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it may be too late um, to get it together for the listen show, because that's in two weeks, so I might not be able to. Oh. But, you know, there's a lot of um, experimenting with, with cameras and different sorts of approaches to narrative that um, because we couldn't move, we had to 
we have to have those conversations with ourselves and, and, and others. So, um, as I said, this has changed me fundamentally. And I think the work which will start to come out in the next seven months will, will show that, you know. Um, it's not like, a, it's not, it's not that I've sort of changed my attitude <laughs> or anything to, you know, it's just that, um, put it this way, the moment has confirmed certain things for me. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of ticked some of my boxes and, and, and told me what feels right and what doesn't feel right. And what I, crucially, what I need to worry about and what I don't really need to worry about anymore, you know. Um, okay. So there'll be, there'll be works which will be summations of earlier stuff or works which will be in conversation with earlier stuff but but some that will just not be in conversation of some will be just new departures completely so you know i can't wait <laughs> i can't wait either i mean and john i mean it's it's we've we've had a conversation that's lasted over 20 years so it's always yes. a pleasure to hear and see the evolution and there are certain filmmakers like say for example julie dash who did daughters of the dust or um Charles Burnett, who did uh, Slaughter, Killer of Sheep, you know, and so there's, there's a kind of a bedrack of um, affirmative, what I view as very positive progressive people who've done cinema, and then there's really progressive uh, people who've done documentary, and somewhere you were able to synthesize and triangulate and then push the whole narrative into the fine arts, so it's been really um, an absolute pleasure to see that evolution, so um, just out of respect for your time and the time for the museum, I just want to say, um, my name is Paul Miller, aka DJ Spooky, here in New York City, and this is John. Um, and I guess you know we. This is a conversation about potentialities and future history, and um, it's. I love hearing John wax, you know, forth about his philosophy of cinema. It's. Um, I could listen for hours.